Okay. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, this was an idea that Jay-Z had like kind of sent out in an email that it would be great to have some Perl basics. Um, now, I don't think I can cover Perl in an hour teaching that to you guys. And I probably can't cover setting up a dev box. So we do have a uh, pre-recorded YouTube of that. Uh, me, Jay-Z, and Kyle setting that all up. So please do watch that. This is going to assume that you have a dev box set up. Um, and I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about some easy ways to play with the Koha code and what you can do there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get rid of all these little windows. <laughs> um, so in our one of our meetings this week, it, it came up the fact uh, that the place hold button in Koha shows up on the details page sometimes when you can't place a hold on that. Um, I'm hoping that I still, okay. So this is what you see on the OPAC. The reasoning behind this is that it costs a lot to figure out what can or cannot be placed on hold in Koha. And when I say costs a lot, I mean it takes a lot of processing power. There's a lot of kind of calculations that have to be made to determine whether a book in the end is holdable or not. In the interest of making the OPAC move faster and doing things like that, we don't do all of those calculations all of the time. Um, but just playing with it, this seemed like an interesting place to start of like, you might want to one, you know, looking at this, you might say, hey, why can't this be placed on hold? And you might be curious and kind of want to get more of a reason behind that. Um, so what I did just to prepare for today is I went ahead and I wrote a little script here. Um, which can you guys see that? It just says Perl, holds check PL, borrower number five, item number equals one. Can you um, make it a little bigger, Nick, a little bit? There is a way, and I always forget how to do it. So let me see if I can do that real fast. Uh, does it work? Yes. thought there was a way, but I cannot remember. It's okay. Mm, preferences. Somebody ping Kyle and ask him because there is a way to do it. I just can't remember what it is. Okay. Um, Because most of this is going to take place in the terminal, so you probably do want to figure that out. If nothing else, if you could scoot your term the top and bottom edges of your terminal in a little bit, um, Zoom likes to stick some stuff at the top of your screen share and the bottom of your screen share that covers things up. Okay, let me do this then. Thank you. All right, so let's get back into our main terminal. And then I'm just going to copy this paste over here. I usually use a different terminal, and that's just the reason that it's not. OK. That looks so if better. I run, <clears throat> that's good. <laughs> um, so all this does is this is just a little script. It takes a borrower number, it takes an item number, and it spits out a few things here. One, it spits out the OPAC item holds rule, which is whether or not you're allowed to place holds. Um, and it says yes. And then it also shows me um, is available, meaning how many items are available to hold. There is one. And then can I place a hold? My can is limit zero status, too many reserves. So in this case, the reason this person can't place a hold is because they have a limit of zero holds allowed and they get back too many reserves. Now, just as an aside, I have a bug out there that makes it, instead of passing too many reserves, no reserves allowed, because that's a little more honest here. But that's neither here nor there. That's just me asking you to please sign off on my bugs. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is show you the script real quick, and then go a little bit through of how I kind of pulled out these pieces of code in here to see what they're going to do. Um, 
Nick, do you know the bug number for that one offhand? Lizette's asking. I don't off the top of my head. It's called like too many holds appears too often and is a lie or something. Okay, I'm gonna go look for it. Uh, it's bug 16787. So this is a really short script as you can see, and there's a couple parts of it. Um, all the Perl scripts are gonna start with this user bin Perl. Um, that's just telling the system, hey, this is a Perl file. That's how you're gonna use it. Um, I have two, two tools here. At the top of all your Perl scripts are the use statements. These are importing external Perl modules um, that we can use. We can call all the functions that are in those modules or the exported functions of those modules um, and use them in our own scripts. So these two, the first two, use data dumper and git opt long. Um, data dumper is a debugging tool. If you watched the debugging session from Kohathon, um, Kyle and I use data dumper a whole bunch there and kind of talk about that. It is a good tool for any of this interaction you would want to do. Um, git opt long. This is kind of a Koha standard um, feature that we use. It's a Perl option that lets you take command line input and get it into your script. Um, so we have git opt long. This git options comes from there. And it just takes borrower number equals s. This tells me that if I pass the borrower number parameter, um, I'm going to get a string. And I should take that string and put it into the borrower number variable. Same thing for item number. Take item number from the command line, put it into this variable here. Um, the next thing that we do, we have our Koha use statements. So we've got C4 reserves. Um, C4 are the original Koha modules. Um, Koha was replacing a system, I believe, called C3. It had been the you know, third iteration of that or whatever. And so Koha began with C4 because whatever it was, it was going to be better than C3. <laughs> um, so C4 reserves. A lot of our old modules haven't been moved over. The next ones we have are our Koha modules. These are the more up-to-date um, things usually have been retooled, and these are kind of our modern Koha things. Um, in this case, Koha circulation rules, Koha items, and Koha patrons all happen to be um, object modules. So Koha is moving towards a very object-oriented approach. Um, if you're not familiar with that, uh, an object is just sort of like a, it's a collection of variables and methods that act on those variables. So an object, once you have one, like an object in this case, here's where we get one. Um, an item object has all the information about the item and it has a number of useful scripts that you can call on it. Um, things like you can call items biblio and that will go ahead and get you all the biblio information from that item. Um, I don't know what other, <laughs> functions are off the top of my head, but I can kind of show you guys some of that as we go along. Um, I am moving quickly because we only have an hour and my gosh, Koha is complicated. <laughs> so if you have any questions, feel free to ask them at any point and I'll do my best. Um, and I'll try not to talk too fast. You're doing great, Nick. Thanks. So We've got our use statements. This just declares all of the things basically that we're planning to use in our script. Um, then we can declare some variables. That's just a mine item number. And this is just real basic Perl. Get our options. This has kind of set us up to where we can actually start doing work in this script. Um, the first things we do is I go ahead and I call Koha items find. Um, interacting with Koha objects, we use um, Perl DBAX class. That essentially gives us a shorthand that turns into database queries. Um, when you see this Koha items find, this is really similar to saying select star from items where, and then the parameter section is what you're looking for. Um, so in this case, I'm saying find the items where the item number equals this item number, um, that's gonna get me a single object back. Um, that's what find means when you see it for Koha objects. It's asking to find a single object in the database. The other thing you might see in this is a search. The 
the difference between search and find is that find expects you to have one result. And so you need to have something unique like the item number or a borrower number, things like that barcode. Um, and search will let you return multiple results. So next we have Koha patrons find, and we find the borrower number. So at this point, basically what we have is we have an item and a patron. These are what we need to start determining why on the OPAC we wouldn't, would or would not be able to place that hold. So the next thing we do um, is my Koha circulation rules, get effective rule. Um, so this is what I was talking about objects. Our circulation rules have now been moved into objects. So all the rules that you set up about who can check out an item, how long they can check it out for, all of that live in the Koha circulation rules table. The object is for interacting with that. One of the cool functions that we have for circulation rules is get effective rule. Um, this is gonna go and do a whole bunch of magic behind the scenes. It's gonna look at your system preferences. It's gonna say, um, what is your Homer holding branch set to? Um, basically the system preferences that say, I cannot think of the one that I want here, but it says whether you're gonna use the libraries, um, the patron's home library to figure out the circulation rules, whether you're using the item's home library to figure out the circulation rules. Cir control. Cir control, thank you. <laughs> Um, and in this case, yeah, it is cert control. Um, even though this is related to reserves, it's not reserves control. Or reserves control. control. This is the nice thing about get effective rule is that we've kind of said you don't have to remember all of the syspress. You don't have to know all of these things. You can call this get effective rule and Koha is going to go do all that math for you and determine which circulation rule actually applies in this case. Um, but it needs several pieces of information. So it needs the category code, which is the patron's category code. It needs the item type, which is, in this case, we call item effective item type. Um, effective item type, it's another one of those little cool, like pre-built modules in case you don't remember things. Um, depending on your setting of item level I types, your item type might come from the item type, or it could be coming from the biblio item. Almost everybody uses, I think, item level item types, but if you're not this way, you know, just make sure that we don't forget in the code to check that preference and do anything. We just call effective item type. Um, and you'll notice this is kind of standard language. Effective is a way for us to say like, in this instance, what do we need? So then we have the patron's branch code. Branch code um, and the rule name. So the rule names, just to explain a little bit the way that this is all organized now, is that in your circulation and finds rules, each of these columns essentially is a different rule and has a different name. Um, I believe that the one we're calling, which is OPAC item holds is, it's this one, OPAC item level holds. So we're just checking that. Oops, wrong, force of habit, opening the wrong terminal. Um, and all I do then is I use this data dumper, like I said, to dump the rule out to the command line. That's when we run it, what we see here, that's that rule. Now, just as an aside, when you're playing with Koha and when you're playing with objects, if you're trying to debug things and dump them out places, um, when you use dumper, if you just dump the variable, you know, it does a good job of trying to format it and do things, but just to show you that rule is an object. And one of the things about objects is that they don't only have data, they have methods and they have a lot of other things associated with them. So if we actually dump that object out straight away, we get this, which is, kind of a whole list of everything about the database and all of these things. That did not seem to work for me, I don't think. Jay-Z was telling me how to enlarge the screen and I was not able to make it work. I have figured this out in the past, but I cannot get it to do it today. 
Oh, that made it smaller. There, there we go. go. That, there we go. All right, now I just need to resize the window a little bit. Thank you, Kyle, from far away. All right. So as I was saying, when, if you dump the whole object out, you'll know what you've done immediately because this goes on for quite a long time. Um, this is the, uh, the flip side of using objects is that they have a lot of overhead. Um, they carry a lot of the information. Like the, this is the rule that we dumped. It has a relation to biblios and items and all of these things. So when you're using dumper, if you get an object like that, you can just, I'm gonna stop trying to hit all the wrong keys. Unblessed, and that's gonna give you that. Um, the next thing we do, these are just, is available for item level request. This takes an item in the patron. Can item be reserved? We try to be pretty straightforward with our uh, method names like we do with our system preference names. They're not always the most clear, <laughs> um, but that's what they do. And then I'm just gonna, I just print out whether it's available. And my can is, it turns out that can item be reserved returns more than just a simple um, yes or no. So I use data dumper to dump that one out because um, you'll see if we look at that output again. So this is a dumper output. It's a, it's a hash here. We have keys on one side and values on the other. Um, this is just kind of a common structure that we use a lot of. So that's one thing you can look up at hashes um, and hash refs too, which are just references to hashes. Not all the stuff I can cover in this hour. Um, so is available one and my can is, and you see can is a little more complicated than just like a, a yes or no switch. This is all really just to show you that this script took me about an hour to put together, going through the code and determining how I was going to build this out. Um, what I really like about this method is that it lets me kind of get some of the data out of Koha and look at it on a much smaller scale. Um, if you watch the debugging video that Kyle and I did, we go, kind of go into the Koha modules, we put warns in there and we dump out the things and we get that input by directly interacting with Koha. So we would go in here, we would click this place hold, dump the variables and see what comes out in the logs. Writing little scripts like this that use the Koha modules um, kind of lets you redo these things a little bit quicker. So I can say, you know, I can try it with a different item number right away. Um, in this case, there probably is no item number three in my database, so that didn't work so well. <laughs> Same thing there. Uh, so that I can see more information. Um, one thing that I didn't do that I was going to save for doing here is let's edit that file again. I already have it open. Oh, because I have it open here. Uh, yeah, no, I'm in the wrong terminal again. <laughs> Force of habit. So here what I can do is, you may not know all your items and borrowers by number. Um, this is the nice thing that I can do because we're using these objects, is I can say, okay, I don't wanna take a borrower number anymore. I wanna take a barcode. And actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna swap things around a little bit. I'm gonna say card number. Take the barcode for the item, take the card number for the patron, since that's what we call them. And since we've already grabbed the objects down here, all I need to do is change this search that we're doing. So before where we were searching for item number matches the item number put in, I'm gonna change it to barcode matches, the barcode pulls in. And same thing down here, I'm gonna change this to card number. And 
card number. Then put little spaces there just because it's nice to code neatly. Happy little code. Do whatever you want. Happy accidents. <laughs> um, except now I have to change how I call it. Did you just say happy accidents? I was, yeah, doing a little Bob Ross there. <laughs> <Yeah>. Just <laughs> apologies. Um, now, see, in this case, I don't actually know anybody's card number in my test system. So I'm going to have to look that up. We'll go to Edna, who's my favorite patron. And not go to that screen again. Hmm. I think this again means that I don't actually have this barcode in my system. That might mean I didn't install the things that I normally do. All right, so I don't know why I'm getting this error. Let's see, it's in C4 Reserves Online 360. Um, and if you're writing one of these little scripts and you get them, this is what you'll do, is just look at the error there. It can't call method Biblio and undefined. So let's go to C4 Reserves, line 360. So the item is not coming through and that's probably because when I changed everything, I didn't change this to pass the right items anymore. So in the past, can item be reserved? It takes the borrower number and the item number. Since I changed the variables and those aren't what I'm getting from the script anymore, I need to make sure that I'm actually passing the right things here. All right. Any questions about the concept of this so far? Just the idea of taking these these Koha objects and these Koha things and using them to do, do a little work and get some data out of Koha. Not yet, Nick. Okay. Cool. So what I'm gonna do next then is just to show you how I kind of got to this point. Um, and how I kind of built this script out and how I figured out what I wanted to find along the way. So we can start by going back to the page here. Um, so my question initially was, you know, why does this placeholder button show up here and what determines then on this next page, why can't I see it? Um, I think this is actually where I started, was on OPAC Reserve to say, why can't I place any hold from this? So if I inspect this element, I can see um, no items that can be placed on hold. There's nothing really good to grab on here, but I can see um, the name of the template file. I doubt you guys can see that, but it's always there in everything. If I go to page source, um, at the start of every page is this template file. So it tells us where to find that on the system. So I'm gonna go back here. Now there's a few ways you can find these. Um, I usually install locate, which is a fun little function that lets me just do locate opac-reserve, and it'll go find on my system all the files that are there. Um, if you choose to go this method, um, just look up locate, it's apt install locate. Um, but what I will caution you on a Koha testing docker is to make sure that you use the files in Koha DevBox. Um, if you try editing the files or making any adjustments to the ones in the user share, uh, this is the installed Koha. This is the Koha clone, which is your master. And if you make edits to these files, they will never show up when you're testing. Um, and I definitely haven't spent, you know, two hours modifying the code and wondering why I can't see my changes. <laughs> so just a word of advice. Um, so I'm gonna go to this OPAC reserve file. And then I'm just gonna look for that error message that I got over here. There are no items that can be placed on hold. 
Um, I use Vim for my editor. Um, this is what Kyle taught me to do. <laughs> um, you can use Nana or whichever editor. In Vim, hitting a forward slash gets me to this little search box down here, and that's how I'm going through these files. Um, so I see down here, unless bib item loo bib available, there are no items that can be placed on hold. Now, this is, this is my personal belief, but um, one of the big things in debugging and looking at Koha is essentially, I think, what I'd like to think of as uh, putting on your magic blinders and reading what you can understand and the parts that you can't understand just in your head, replace them with magic happens um, and don't worry about them. <laughs> Um, so, like, I can kind of tell you, bib item loo, I know that this means that we're in a loop. Um, it means that we're probably in a bib item loop. And bib item is probably one biblio item. And biblio item might not mean, like, literal biblio item in this case, but some sort of bib plus item information thing. Um, and we're going through a whole collection of them in a loop, and each one we're calling bib item loo. That's sort of the thing that you learn by working with Koha for a long time, is that you're going to see things like this, um, where loo is a single instance of a thing in a loop. Um, but what I really care about here, probably, is this, the idea that unless the bib is available. So somewhere we've made this calculation for bib available. And that's kind of where I want to start digging in to see what bib available really means. Um, and the way that I do that is I'm just going to do a git grep bib. Uh, I can't tab it out. So, well, I just tried to hit tab there because tab completion is the thing you can do. But what I really did was git grep for bib avail. I could type it all the way out if I wanted to. Um, and I see it in three different files. Um, there's opac reserve.tt where I just was. There's the other end of it in opac tt where I just was. And there's an instance in opac reserve.pl. Now, when we're in Koha, we can see that's the script that we were on. So that's where I'm going to want to go look for what set that bib available equal to one. And I'm just going to again, search for bib available. OK. So what I see here is that bib available is set to 1 in this if number of copies available is greater than 0. So I'm going to repeat my search. It says search hit bottom, continuing at top, if you see that down there in the red. Um, that means this is the only occurrence of it. So what I can do is then look at this code and I say, OK, this is in an if statement. So what is really determining whether or not we're setting bib available is this variable num copies available. OK, so now I'm going to shift my attention away from is bib available to num copies available. Um, and just another aside, <laughs> we, we sort of call this the, the mental stack is what we're building right now. Um, Having a notepad in front of you and writing down kind of what you've gone through is probably really helpful. Um, but a, a part of, I think, being able to do this is learning to just kind of keep in your head what steps you've gone through. Um, it's why developers don't like to be disturbed because our mental stack crashes and then we have sads. <laughs> so number of copies available. Whenever I see this my next to a variable, variable, that's the declaration of it. So this is the first time in the code, probably, that we're going to see num copies available. It might not be the first time, because we could have different scopes of num copies available. Um, and different scopes are just in different parts of the code can have their own variables that other parts of the code can't see. It's likely in a script, when you're in a Perl script, that most of the variables are global and available to the whole script. Some of them, like if down here we have this for each and then these my statements, these only apply inside of this for each. But for the most part, we're not going to reuse this name outside of the loop because that's just going to be confusing. Um, but for due diligence, I'm just going to keep searching for num copies available and see how many places it shows up. Um, so the next place I see it down here is um, 
num copies available plus plus in this if loop, um, which is if opac hold policy does not equal no. So if it's yes or F, um, then we're going to, it's actually in the other loop, but that's one of the things we check. Um, and then down here, if num copy is available, this is where we have originally came across this variable. So there's only one place that it gets incremented in the code, and it's kind of right here. Um, inside of this if statement. Now it turns out that the second time I'm looking at this code, I realized this if statement doesn't actually control <laughs> whether it's going to get, um, oh no, there it is. It is in there. Okay. I just missed it. So num copies available relies on this if statement. Um, so the first thing I want to check is what is this opac hold policy? Because that's going to determine whether or not num copies available got incremented. Um, and so again, we're just kind of shifting our focus and now I'm going to go to opac underscore hold policy. And it only shows up right here. So I don't need to look at any other code to determine that. Um, and this is where I see it's the Koha circulation rules, get opac item holds policy, and it takes item in patron. This is where I stop looking at the script and I say, okay, let me go and I'm going to take this piece of code and I'm just going to copy it. And that's when I put, I put it into this script here. Um, and is that the right one? No, because apparently I got rid of this piece of code earlier, but this is what I would do to determine that kind of, I think I took this out on purpose to make myself do this. Um, uh, so what I'm going to try is just adding to the code this print here that's going to print out that um, because I'm using a print statement, I'm going to want to make sure to add a new line afterwards. And then just because we already have other things in the code, I'm going to go ahead and do some little things surrounding it, just so I know that this is the part of the code we're seeing. Um, backslash n just happens to be a new line. It doesn't happen to be, it is. <laughs> but I just know that one. Um, all right. Now, just to backtrack for a minute, this is what I would do. I'm kind of relatively certain that I understand that item means it's getting an item object and patron means it's getting a patron object. And I already have those in my script, so I'm all set. But we can take a moment to go ahead and look. Um, so when we see Koha circulation rules get OPAC item rules policy, you see it's Koha, two colons, circulation rules, and then this points to. So that means we can go into the Koha circulation rules dot PM. And then this is the way I do the search. I do B because it's always going to start with sub git opac. And I'm going to stop typing and just search for it. So now we have the pod. If the developers have done a good job, um, we have this Perl documentation that should tell us what kind, what is going on here and what it takes. Um, we don't actually specify here that these are patron objects. Normally we could, um, but we say we return yes or F if the pa patron can place a hold on this item according to the issuing rules um, and item level holds. So it can be N would be don't allow, Y is allow, F is force. And it's gonna call get effective cert rule um, which is what I then pulled out into my code later. So that's that. And now we can do our Perl again. String operator line 24. Ah, I need to say that I'm concatenating these because this was not a string. That's a result and this is a string. Syntax error line 24, because I forgot a semicolon. 
Okay. So now we can see that we have plus, 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 and we get this Y in between them. So we know now that that point which we had left in the opaque reserve script, we're getting a Y there. And we can go back to right here. Um, oh, and this is actually non copies opaque available, which I didn't realize before, but that's my fault. Um, so we know that the answer to the hold policy circulation is yes, we're going to enter this part of the loop. Um, and so we should hit this num copies available. But looking again, I realized I had missed this the first time around. If policy hold allowed determines whether we're in this loop where we're going to increment the number of copies available. So if we're saying that there's no copies available, it means this is where we're not hitting it. Um, and it's perfectly fine to do that and miss and look at other things along the way. <laughs> um, so now we're going to search, we can search for my uh, policy hold allowed as well just like we've been doing. We just kind of keep doing these steps along the way and narrowing down and going through. So again, it's only in these three places, so we don't need to look far. We can just kind of center in on this code. So my policy hold allowed, we initially set it to the not of already reserved. And this is a fun thing that I did earlier because I said, okay, what's not already reserved? We have an if on already reserved. We have bib loop iter already reserved, but we're an item loop iter. As far as I can tell, this is never actually set for item loop iter at any point. Um, these names are confusing, <laughs> um, but it doesn't really matter because the next thing we do is we, we check that first and then we're checking policy hold allowed and and equals. Um, what this just basically means is sort of this could all be one policy hold allowed is not this and this statement and this statement. How you see these these two are joined with that and there. This could be joined with that and there because it's an anding and assignment. I think it's just on another line to be more readable. <laughs> And that's sort of too some of the like magic things you can just kind of disregard. But what you really want to know is what are the answers to these two statuses? Because these are the other things that are going to determine whether or not it can be held. Um, again, I see that this is getting item and patron. I make an assumption that those are objects from the database. I see that this is taking borrower num and item num, and that those are probably a borrower number and item number. But again, it never hurts to go and look at that code. So I copy it over to my thing here. Is available for item level request. Can they be reserved? And then I can go and look at them in the code. Um, just another thing to show you guys, because this is the way I would really usually do this too, if I'm working on a script. Um, in Vim at least, you can name two files and put a dash O. That opens them side by side so that you can kind of go through the code on one side uh, where were we right here and compare it to the code on the other side um, to make sure that you've kind of copied it right to see what else you want to add and change along the way So now I do have to remind myself, we're looking for is available for item level request. So I'm gonna do what I did before, so I'm just gonna do a git grep. This time I'm gonna put the B there. This will ensure that I only get where the subroutine lives. And it lives in C4 reserves. So I can go into C4 reserves. I think it was is available for item level request. Um, and I can see it takes the item into patron. Above, fortunately, I do have a pretty decent description of what it's gonna do. It checks whether it's an available. It's available if it's not lost, damaged, withdrawn, waiting in transit, does not have a for loan, all of that stuff. Um, now in this case, before I start reading this code, I can, as long as I can figure out what to pass it and what to call it, um, I have my script call it. 
the is available comes back with one. So I can either go look at that script just to be curious why it did come back with one, or I can say that's not what's causing me to get to this. Where's my screen? <laughs> to get to the no items can be placed on hold. So I can move on to the next part of it, which was the can item be reserved. So I can do the same thing with can item be reserved that I just did with the other one. Okay. And here we have all the information about that. Now in this case, we get a list of what it returns. It's returning a hash ref um, with a status and whether or not it can be reserved. Um, it doesn't list it, but we've seen in our, in our output that it also returns, oh, there it is, too many reserves. If we have too many reserves, it returns the limit, um, which is how many holds the borrower can place. And now we can just start digging through this code to determine where that zero came from, um, if we want to. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to check in and see, are there any questions at this point? No, but Lizette did say, no questions, but it is very helpful, much faster than replicating in Koha. And that was after your last comment. Okay. And that's kind of the, the point of this is that when I come in here, reading all of this can get a little bit hectic. Uh, you have a lot to keep in your head as you kind of dig down through the code. Um, and so a lot of times what I do now in debugging is do this method of just pulling all of the things out and putting them into a little script where I can just see them happen. Um, it also saves me the trouble of doing things like placing a hold, checking if that hold was placed, unplacing the hold, and doing all of that stuff. Um, so that's mostly what I wanted to show. Um, kind of just the idea of going in, getting these things, how you can play with the objects a real little bit. Um, there's a lot more to all of this, obviously. <laughs> But that should at least, you know, give you enough to get started. And I can share this code with Jay-Z um, so that we can put it on the website and you guys can all go try this out. Um, now, one word of caution, if you are self-hosted and you have access to your own Koha command line, please don't run these there. <laughs> um, you will notice I am running these, I am running these on localhost. I am running these on my Koha test instance. Um, you can easily, once you start going into the code, do some unintended consequences and delete or update your data. Uh, so be careful with this power. We always debug on our test systems before we go do anything to the live systems because it's just a good idea. And I feel like I can never emphasize enough, like, please be careful. <laughs> Excellent. And then if we have, if we want to take like, I don't know that I have enough time to do a lot of it, but I kind of wanted to show off one other way that people can interact and get some data from their systems. Okay. Um, so I'm going to switch gears over here. And I, this is not working on my test engine, so I'm actually going to try it on, let's see. Let's go to train one first. <laughs> Andrew holds his breath while I do this. Uh, so you all have this on your systems. Um, it actually works with just the, <laughs> I'm not doing anything Donna, I'm just showing off the API, I promise. Um, you can do this on any of your Koha systems. If you take your OPAC URL and put it in here and then add this slash API slash v1 dot HTML, um, this will take you to a listing of the Koha API. It's gonna give you all of the endpoints that are available and it's gonna give you all of the information about how to access those endpoints um, and kind of what you can do. So I'm going to start here with this git API v1 libraries ID. Git is for getting information out of the system and seeing it. So if we go here, we can see git API v1 libraries library ID. Now to use this with the most basic things, I need to be logged in. 
um, I'm not going to be able to just pull information about libraries out of your system without being logged into your system. <laughs> That's a good thing. I just have to figure out how to get to train one now. There we go. And I don't know my password, but I assume. Yep. <laughs> don't tell Kelly. <laughs> oh, hi, Kelly. Didn't know you were here. That's fine. Um, so I'm just going to take this, go to the Koha staff client. I'm going to put in this API v1. And over here is API v1 libraries. And I can just hit that and I can get a listing of all of the um, library information from the database. If I go ahead and put in one of these library IDs, I can get just that single one. Let's see, that's not how it works. I think it's actually the branch code is the library ID. So let's try library. ID. Oh, there you go. Library ID. E. And there we go. So I can easily kind of go ahead and interact with that and get that information out. You can do that real easily for any of these Git ones. Um, you can get a little more complicated. I haven't done this in a while, but we're gonna go ahead and mess with train because it's gonna be fun. We'll see if we can make it work. Um, you'll need a tool to interact with the API. Um, you can do it by the command line with curl, um, or you can use, I have a built-in um, browser extension called rester, which lets me do a little more. So if we go to this put API for libraries, um, it's this same URL. The method, um, a, a general like HTTP request through your browser is a GET request, but I can change this into a POST request. Um, now, once I do that, we can see that I'm required to give the library ID in the path. Um, so library ID required, yes, in path. In body, I need a JSON object containing information on the library. This is one of those where I'm like, oh, how do I do this now? So I'm going to go ahead and take, oh, I can't see. There we go. I'm going to take this raw library data, which is the JSON. I also have a browser extension that takes my JSON and makes it show pretty, but I can change it to raw data. Put this all into the body. Um, and now I'm just going to try making this 50 Hudson Avenue. That's the only thing I'm going to change. Response 404 not found. Oh, why didn't it find it? Hmm. Well, I didn't get it right. But anyway, we don't have that much time. That's the sort of long and short of it. Um, I wasn't prepared for that today because the API is broken in master. I was having a hard time getting it working. Um, but it is pretty easy to play with it along those lines. I'm not sure why I'm getting the 404. That'll be a future uh, education topic that we can cover is kind of playing with the API and things you can do. Um, but the get part of it is really easy to use, seeing the parameters here very simple to get into. Um, and what I will say is when you try to do these, the put and the post and the deletes, um, it's gonna check your Koha authorization first. It's gonna check the permissions that you have. So don't be afraid that anyone's just gonna go and start hitting your um, library endpoint and deleting them. They need to have permissions to be able to do that in order to access it um, and permission to access Koha. Excellent, Nick, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you guys for coming and listening to me. If we have any questions, Nick will answer them. I can answer questions about where to find information on our website. We will post to the um, how to install 
our Koha testing docker? Yes. We'll link that video out as well. Cool. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.